presenting, feel free to shoot that question in the chat box and we will engage with you throughout our time together there. If you have a question that might be a little bit uh, longer in length or that might require a bit more conversation to support an answer, we ask that you would hold that because at the very end of the webinar, we will have a open floor of Q&A. So if you would like to ask a question um, to any presenter specifically or just a general thought that comes to mind, we'll have a chance for you to do so at the very end and we'll answer those questions in real time. So you all have done a great job to introduce yourselves. I do want to introduce myself. My name is Erin Glenn. I am the your own project manager here with the department and am joining the department by way of school districts. So um, having experience in the district, I definitely look forward to engaging with you beyond our time today. I hope to be a resource for you to help answer questions, whether it's about the application, the onboarding, um, work throughout, or anything that may come up throughout your experience in, in supporting district work with the apprenticeship model. Please know that I hope to be a resource for you um, throughout. So uh, definitely a clean, glad to have you and excited to get to engage with you as an introduction today and then moving forward forward in the weeks to come. Um, as you see on our next slide, we have a jam-packed uh, amount of time with us today. Lots of objectives and a goals that we want to, uh, to make sure that are covered. We're going to start our, our webinar with a kickoff from Senior Director Emma McCauley, who is going to dive into all things apprenticeship model to help unpack the elements of the apprenticeship and what all is included uh, throughout. We're going to hear from Ms. Charlene Russell, who is going to talk to us from the Tennessee Department of Labor, Workforce and Development to really help our understanding of some of the legalities and the components of the apprenticeship model, just to make sure that we have that overarching understanding of the variation and the, and the, the model itself that we are shifting to with our, our Grow Your Own Pathways. We will then uh, turn it over to a bit of information from the Grow Your Own Center from Mr. Bernie Savarese. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the Grow Your Own Center as a hub of technical assistance, as a resource, uh, in addition to a lot of the resources that you're going to learn about that are uh, housed at the center and how you can use and access them throughout your work with candidates in your, in your district. Um, following him, we're going to hear again from uh, Ms. Emma McCauley, who's going to talk to us about the role of EPPs in the work. They are a, a critical component, as well as others, in understanding the model of the apprenticeship as a partner that you'll be working closely with throughout, as well as district application components and what all is included from, from their end and also from your end. We will get to hear directly from a district representative, uh, Tracy Kuhn, who is going to be coming from us from Clarksville Montgomery Schools, and she is going to talk to us about how this apprenticeship is on a day to day basis. Some of the things that that will help understanding as you consider onboarding and and where to start. And we will follow it, as I shared earlier, with an opportunity for you to ask some questions. We want to give you some answers to help start your next steps as you think about uh, what's needed to get the Grow Your Own model up and running in your school district. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and dive in. It's it's my pleasure to turn it over to the senior director of the Grow Your Own team uh, with TDOE, Ms. Emma McCauley. Thank you, Aaron, and it's good to see friendly and familiar faces and good to see new faces today. As Aaron mentioned, my name is Emma McCauley and I have the pleasure of working on all things Grow Your Own every single day here in Tennessee. Uh, for those directors on the line, thanks for joining us again. This might be a little bit of deja vu from what you would have heard in Gatlinburg. Our hope is to dive a little bit deeper today so that not only our directors can hear, but all of our other folks in the district that we know so often support this work on a day in and day out basis have a chance to hear whether that's you coming to the table with an HR hat on, um, with a academic hat on, or our educator support hat on. Thanks for being here. Thanks for making the time. Um, the first piece that I want to just call your attention to, if our tech is working today, which knock on wood so far so good, uh, there is a QR code that can help reference a visual for today's presentation on the teacher apprenticeship application for new programs. We'll be referencing that a couple of times throughout the slides. You'll see some screenshots, but if you're the type of person who likes to have that in front of you, um, there's a QR code and I imagine Justin or someone else kind of behind the scenes can drop that into our chat as well. I think I might have just lost slides, uh, but good enough. We can go on without it. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about today is 
model. We'll be talking about how you can shift your program from a grow your own program to a registered teacher occupation apprenticeship still within a grow your own structure. For those who have not yet participated in Grow Your Own or starting to think about different strategies that your district can use for educator recruitment, hear me say loud and clear, this is for you as well. Regardless if you have participated in TDOE's Grow Your Own work up until now, um, you can participate. Justin, that is the best picture of your cats, and I'm so glad that everybody on here got to see a picture um, of those two furry friends. If we jump to the next slide, we'll go ahead and keep moving. Um, I want to acknowledge that in Tennessee, the Grow Your Own work has been ongoing, and again, this is just for back pocket reference. 65 of our districts across the state have participated in Grow Your Own partnerships up until now, and with 147, again, this information is for everyone regardless of your participation up until now. 14 of our 43 EPPs, our colleges and universities, have participated in Grow Your Own work, but you'll hear some of the necessary shifts in programming that would happen from a Grow Your Own program to a teacher occupation apprenticeship. What I want to be sure to say uh, loud and clear again for everyone on this call is that we have maintained some phenomenal programs. We have some tremendous lessons learned and from the agency's perspective, we are very excited and optimistic about this future sustainable strategy for teacher apprenticeships moving forward. So Justin, if you go ahead and jump to the next slide. I want to give an overview just of some roles and responsibilities. I think what folks are going to hear a lot during this webinar is that there are many players at the table and many partners to this work. And so when we take two steps back and think about how we transitioned from grow your own programs to this mention of an apprenticeship and where this came from, in January of 2022, in this year, uh, Tennessee Department of Education received approval from the United States Department of Labor, approving that we could maintain, support, and build teacher occupation apprenticeships. There had never been a teacher apprenticeship before. We can think of welders, electricians, but teachers had not been apprenticeable before. This work in, in all ways was made possible by Clarksville Montgomery, who we have represented on the call and you'll hear from later today, as well as their partner with Austin P University, leveraging their work that started with Grow Your Own. What I want anyone to hear on the call today is again, Clarksville is a phenomenal flagship opportunity. You'll get to engage with Tracy Kuhn later today. What we also want districts to be able to understand is we have multiple models, multiple modes of delivery, and a lot of flexibility within the customization of these programs to ensure we meet that right district need for your vacancy data and your future planning. Ultimately, that last bullet I'll call attention to, and this is where we're going to talk uh, specifically about the application component today. You see that line that says the state reviews, monitors, and approves quality applications for locally driven teacher apprenticeship programs. If we jump to the next slide, I want to go ahead and emphasize um, many of the components that you'll see outlined in the application and what needs to be true of any program. Charlene Russell, again, our partner from Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development, has been a tremendous partner in helping us in the K-12 space understand the translation of many workforce pieces. Hear me say it was a shift in strategy for us to have EPPs, our colleges and educator preparation institutions, lead, drive in many ways the application that we'll talk about today. They offer models, multiple program deliveries for districts to engage with and select with. True of any program, regardless of the EPP you might partner with or regardless of the districts you are in, these five things, these five components would be true of any registered teacher apprenticeship. These are also true of any registered apprenticeship outside of the teaching profession. The first is one that most folks are familiar with or can at least make sense with the model and grow your own programs and registered teacher apprenticeships. The employer, the district of that candidate is foundational to the work. That is where the apprentice spends their day to day, working in the district, spending nearly all of their time in a classroom with students, with their mentor teacher. Now we've heard a lot of folks ask about traditional EAs in this space. Can they continue to maintain current responsibilities? Yes, 
And what I want to emphasize in this employer involvement space is that that um, structured on the job training you see in number two is a reflection of the competencies of an apprentice. Charlene will be sure to talk about this a bit, but this approved program is a competency based model. We are evaluating our apprentices, our teacher apprentices on their proficiency and demonstration of skills throughout the duration of their program. That second piece that I'll emphasize in number two, again, is so much of that structured on the job training comes from that side by side experience of a grow your own teacher apprentice with a mentor teacher. We'll talk about some of the stipend opportunities. Uh, Tracy, I'm sure will mention some of the experience they've had in Clarksville Montgomery really supporting high quality mentorships. Um, but that second piece is again the day to day learning that a teacher apprentice has as they are in the district day in and day out. Moving a bit faster through three, four, and five, the related instruction piece, again, true of any apprentice uh, makes sense in this space. Again, that connection to our EPPs. A apprentice is in the district day to day and attends classes, be it virtually or in person on night in the summer, kind of alternative times to pursue their certification and teaching license. Number four, compensation for skill gains. I want to call out that there's some flexibility in this space um, for how a district would increase an apprentice's wage throughout their time. Um, but what I want to emphasize again is that we are or we are building an earn to learn model. Teachers continue to earn a wage as they progress through the program, and that salary would always exceed a minimum wage. The last piece that I know is a national occupation credential uh, at the completion of a program an apprentice would receive uh, and you'll see a picture of it. I think today from Charlene um, a certificate of completion and that would be translatable kind of recognized across the country. The last piece that I'll say on this slide and again in the weeds here is that really what is um, most codified most true and perhaps is going to feel a little bit different for districts who've done grow your own work rather than the teacher apprenticeship is the competencies that are reflected in number two that structured on the job training and that increase in wages reflected in number four this compensation for skill gains again happy to walk through questions wanderings either in q a um, or during our time throughout the the webinar if we jump to the next slide here uh, justin Nearing the end of this time, again, want to just give a visual uh, to the number of players and participants in this work. I think from TDOE's perspective, from the Tennessee perspective, we are so grateful for the number of folks who are a part of this work and want to be sure that at the end of this webinar, you might have a clear sense of where a district lives in their role and responsibility versus other players, be that the EPP, Department of Ed, um, even our local workforce boards, and we'll have a chance to talk about that. So again, want to go ahead and pause. I'm not seeing any particular questions on this topic. I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next slide, which I think is probably a good transition for me to hand it back to Erin so she can introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Erin. Sure thing. Thank you, Emma. So we are going to um, unpack some of the elements that Emma just shared as we understand more about the apprenticeship model from Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development. So at this time we will hear from Ms. Charlene Russell, um, the Middle Tennessee Regional Apprenticeship Coordinator, who's going to share with us all the elements um, that are necessary for this, this new model in Grow Your Own Structures. Thank you, Erin, and thank you everyone for your time today. Um, as Emma said, and Erin mentioned as well, I am the Middle Tennessee Regional Apprenticeship Director. What that means is I serve the 40 counties in the Grand Region of Middle Tennessee, and I work with them to grow um, registered apprenticeship programs. And so this, just like any other registered apprenticeship program, has core components that Emma has already gone over with you. So today we're going to kind of dive into that a little deeper and look at what uh, the roles and responsibilities look like for the teacher apprenticeship program. So what we do in our office, we work with employers, we do a lot of outreach and we consult with those employers on program design. We actually develop the documentation for registration and paperwork. In this case, it's already registered. The teacher program is registered. However, you as the districts, you are the employers. And so we can work with you to develop what your apprenticeship program can look like. Um, and we also provide technical assistance. So I work very closely with Emma and Erin 
to um, get apprentices registered in RAPIDS. RAPIDS is the apprenticeship database for the Department of Labor where all registered apprentices, um, I think we're a little over 6,000 registered apprentices across the state, all of those are registered in RAPIDS. So we do stay on board for that technical assistance piece. So when we talk about a registered apprenticeship program, there are a lot of uh, thoughts that are floating around out there. Maybe that is just in the construction trades. Maybe, you know, electricians go through an apprenticeship. But really what we're talking about here is that flexible and proven talent development strategy that is hundreds of years old, where an individual learns an occupation from someone who is a master in that occupation. There is a mentor piece. There is that structured on-the-job learning piece. And it is a true earn-while-you-learn model. So those five core components that Emma mentioned earlier, we're going to dive into those a little bit more. That first component being employer involvement, and I cannot stress enough how much that um, drives the process. We really do work with employers. Um, I'm, I'm here in Putnam County today. I've been in the Upper Cumberland region meeting with employers to, to talk about how to design registered apprenticeship programs for them to meet their, their workforce needs. So this apprenticeship is no different. Um, it, it is driven and you're going to see in a couple of slides that the districts really are the employer partner in this apprenticeship program. Again, the next component is going to be that structured on the job learning. This was the piece that our office had to go before the U.S. Department of Labor to have approved. It was about a year long process and we worked with the Department of Education. We worked with um, people in education across the country to come up with that structured on the job learning because electrician, because welding, because those are apprenticeships that have been in place for years and years. We have a database. We can go and we can pull what that structured on the job learning looks like for those occupations, for um, CNAs, for insurance agents, for administrative assistants, for tool and die. Um, we can pull those work processes, but teacher was not among that database. So we worked very hard to get that occupation approved to be among those occupations that can be apprenticeable. In addition to the structured on the job learning is the related instruction. And I will say, and Emma, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but the structured on the job learning was developed from the, the team rubric that uh, teachers would be observed on. So those competencies are vetted. In addition to the on the job learning, the related technical instruction does come from your EPPs. So these teachers are still going through their four year program. They are still, you know, passing their praxis. They are still getting their certifications. They are working while they're doing that and they're working um, alongside a teacher who has been, you know, in the industry. They have been practicing for, for a long time. That way they have that model. We also work to build out those rewards for skills gains. So Emma mentioned that she's going to talk through what that can look like. There is an entry wage there. Um, there's also a, a gain in their pay as they become more competent in those um, skills. And then there would be an exit wage. And then finally, there's that stackable credential. So any apprentice across the state is going to earn a national occupational credential. And that occupational credential is going to look like <laughs> the next slide is going to show you this is housed in RAPIDS. So as these apprentices complete, again, this does not supersede their, their licensure. They are still working toward their licensure, but it will be a stackable credential that does imply that they have that on the job learning to support that classroom piece. And, and I noticed that Dr. Beard is on the call today. So I spent my teaching career in Giles County. So I, I served there, I started in 2004 and transitioned to the state in April of 2020. And um, when I first started teaching there in 2004, I had completed my 15 weeks of student teaching. And, you know, then I was in a high school classroom teaching high school science for the next 11 years. And so it is, there is something to be said for that earn while you learn and you're working with a teacher during that time that you're going through school to see what those practices look like that you're learning. And, you know, from the EPPs, you're actually seeing that. And that really has been the difference in different industries that have apprenticeships is those apprentices really are getting that on the job training alongside the classroom piece. 
So here is what a registered apprenticeship will look like. We have entry level apprenticeship programs. So in the education space, we do have occupations. We have registered programs for early childhood educators, and that is a 2000 hour program. It's a competency based program. No apprenticeship is going to be less than 2000 hours, which is about one year of full time employment. Um, and then you move into uh, an electrician or a welder. Those are 8000 hours. But as Emma said, this is a competency based program, so it's less time based and more working with that mentor. They are signing off that the apprentice is becoming um, competent in those skills that are listed in that on the job learning. I will say that what you can do is when an apprentice comes on board, if if they have already completed and, and this this is in other areas where we see this, if they've already completed. Um, a program at an EPP that can be credited 100% of the related instruction. If they've worked in the area before, they can be credited half of the on the job learning. But with this being a competency based model, it really is more of a performance review to kind of see where they are on that continuum of competencies. So this is the real meat and potatoes. Um, there are three roles and responsibilities of a registered apprenticeship program. And when I'm working with an employer to build out a program, this is where we start. There's a sponsor, an employer and a training provider in this model. The Tennessee Department of Education is the sponsor. The districts are the employer and then the EPPs are the training providers. So you can see there that the sponsor has the requirement of registering the apprentices in RAPIDS and documenting that on the job learning and related technical instruction. Forgive me that you're seeing RTI and RI, those are the same things. It's just one of those name changes that have happened at the US Department of Labor over time, and you see it both ways. The employer obviously hires the apprentice and pays them according to the structured wage progression scale. They provide the required on the job learning and the mentor, and they assume the cost of the training. So in assuming the cost of the training, we then connect the employers or the districts back to their local workforce development boards. Our office does receive a pot of money for registered apprentices each year, and we allocate that out to the local workforce development boards who then contract directly with employers and they get that money out to offset training costs of the apprentices. So if you choose to be an employer partner for the apprenticeship program, it, you will have a very close relationship with your business services director in your local area. And those folks will help you navigate what funds are available to maybe reimburse you for some of those training costs. It is reimbursable. It is first come, first serve. It is competitive and it's out there for all apprenticeships. So. We have roughly uh, just under 400 registered apprenticeships across the state of Tennessee, and we do work to, to make sure that that money gets out to those registered apprentices each year. And then finally, the training provider, again, the, the EPP. You'll see the, the statement there at the bottom of the slide when I'm working with an employer. Um, several employers that I work with, they do all three of those, those things internally. But again, in this model, the Department of Education is the sponsor. The districts are the employers and the EPPs are the training providers. So why would I do this? Um, a couple of weeks ago, we traveled to Norfolk, Virginia and met with other states uh, who are SAA or state apprenticeship agencies. And they did let us know that there is some new um, data coming out. We're going to share those statistics, but uh, currently the statistic is for every dollar spent in a registered apprenticeship program, there's a dollar, at least a dollar 47 in ROI. And what we're seeing that is getting that quality pipeline built so that you're not having to spend as much money in recruitment turnover um, and training people who are in and out of, of different uh, occupations. Um, again, there's new data out and, and they, the Office of Apprenticeship, the U.S. Office of Apprenticeship promised us that it was very good promising data. I'm happy to get that out. I'm also happy to share the statistics page where this um, information was, was um, generated from, but I'm excited for you to hear from uh, Clarksville Montgomery School Districts as well because I've heard them talk about the benefits to their district. And, and there are a lot of benefits that aren't aren't even listed on this on this slide that I'm excited for you to hear about. 
So myths. Um, there are a lot of myths floating out there about apprenticeships, and you can see that it's not just a union term. I've registered large employers, but I've also registered a man from Florida who lives in Smithville, Tennessee, who is an electrician. He wanted to pass his trade on to someone, so he registered an apprenticeship, and he has one apprentice. So it really is an earn while you learn model that's for, for anybody. Um, only for construction trades. We touched on that, obviously. It, there are thousands of occupations that we can build apprenticeships around with registered programs, again, in the insurance space, in the healthcare space, in the business space. It's more of a, of a mind shift in the model of training than it is specific to a certain industry. Only for non-college bound individuals. I know that this was a concern when we started talking about teacher apprenticeship, that it was going to supersede their uh, requirements to, to be licensed, and it, it definitely does not. I can tell you that here in Cookville, we have registered two apprenticeships for cosmetologists, and they're more like residency programs. They're for cosmetologists who are already licensed, and then they go through uh, more training to become specialized in a product or, or certain uh, procedures. So we work very, very closely with a lot of different industries. It, it's not just for non-college bound individuals, but I will tell you, it is a good option for, for those students, that middle third, you know, uh, that we're really targeting. It's a great option for them as well. And then uh, the federal government will micromanage. So we are an SAA state as of this spring. We are not an OA state. We are a state apprenticeship agency. Um, all things apprenticeship in Tennessee run through our office. We do not send them to the federal government for approval unless we're adding a new occupation. <laughs> um, so I, I'm one person and I oversee 40 counties. I have a counterpart in East Tennessee and in West Tennessee, and I can promise you that we are not looking to micromanage anyone. We, we are your boots on the ground. We are here to help you. We do not have the bandwidth to micromanage anyone. So these are the contacts. Um, like I said, there is Shalandria in the West, and I cover the middle, and then Jessica covers the East. So across your districts, these will be your apprenticeship, um, your apprenticeship contacts to discuss next steps or if you just have any questions. And then you can see that our state apprenticeship director there, Holly Free Allard, she comes to us from Georgia. She was the state apprenticeship director in Georgia and came on board early in 2021. And then there's our support staff that we couldn't um, make it without. Uh, we have a grants program manager, Leanne Blevins. Our compliance officer is Leanne Kirby. Stephanie is our apprenticeship specialist, and Monica is our administrative assistant. So please reach out with any of um, any questions that you have. Any of us are happy to talk to you about apprenticeships and, and what the model looks like. And then finally, you heard me mention your local workforce development board. So in the Department of Labor, we are split up into nine regions and um, each one of those regions has a local board. So when I say that we have state money that we allocate out, your business services director in each one of these areas will be your contact person to navigate. They're really good people to know um, outside of their apprenticeship space because they can help you navigate uh, we owe a funds that may be available to support your students or your faculty or uh, just what resources are out there in your community. But that is where we send um, our apprenticeship dollars to, to so that they can contract directly with those employers. And so um, that slide has those contacts. And again, I invite you to follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn and take some time to explore our website, apprenticeshiptn.com. The slides that you've seen today, a lot of that came from the website. It's shared on the website. We have some apprenticeship um, conferences that have been recorded and housed there. So please, uh, please check us out and find out what, what the apprenticeship model and how that's different from the Grow Your Own. So thank you, Erin, for your time, and um, I'm going to toss it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Charlene. And um, just hearing the overview, so many great takeaways, but definitely just I've, what sticks in mind is that return on investment. So thank you so much for sharing that information with us as we're learning more about the model and the complexities of the model and how every player is so critical and important in the apprenticeship model. 
So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bernie Savarees. He's going to talk to us about all things Grow Your Own Center from the University of Tennessee. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Aaron. As you said, my name is Dr. Bernie Savarees, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Acting Vice President for Academic Affairs and Student Success for the UT system. It's really, really great to be with everybody today, so thanks for having me and, and making time. Um, I'd love to share on behalf of our, our system president, Randy Boyd, that we're truly honored to be in this position and thrilled to be working with our partners, uh, Emma and Aaron, and the many other colleagues at TDOE to better serve students and teachers uh, in school districts. Um, when it comes to the University of Tennessee system, with our four educator preparatory programs located across the state, as you know, in Knoxville, Chattanooga, Martin, and Pulaski, and of course, UT's presence in all 95 counties uh, through our Institute of Ag, we know we'll be able to reach every corner of the state, and we really hope that is our unique value that we're offering to this program and to the citizens of Tennessee to really help us support student achievement, uh, train high quality teachers, and engage with every school district. Uh, because of that, the Grow Your Own Grant is going to allow us, really working with partners like you, uh, to be able to develop you know, not only low or no cost solutions for our future teachers and principals, but really to develop innovative workforce pathway, workforce pathways and opportunities under this apprenticeship model. Uh, so proud of what's coming together. Now, the Grow Your Own Center is going to be such an important piece of this partnership, right? Through the center, we'll be able to provide technical assistance and help develop and recruit candidates, uh, as well as, as I said, provide those leadership pathway models. Uh, our goal was to truly be a one-stop shop for all EPPs, LEAs, students, and really any person or group interested in being a part of this Grow Your Own initiative. Uh, and so hopefully that's uh, one of your main takeaways, right, is that this Grow Your Own Center will be that one-stop shop for you and so many of our partners. Now to support the, the growth of the center and really this entire initiative, what we hope to share is uh, our center staffing and structures. We want to give a little update on, on how we're going to do all this for you. Uh, and so to support this success, we are uh, conducting a number of searches, and that includes one for the center's new executive director, uh, which we were actually in the process of wrapping up right now. Uh, and we're hope, uh, hoping to make that announcement uh, of that individual in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, we also have several searches actively in progress that will be wrapping up uh, really by uh, hopefully the end of October. And those include a communications manager who will help us coordinate and amplify messaging uh, really to reach all corners of the state about this initiative. Uh, a research and evaluation manager, and four regional program directors located across each of our undergraduate campuses in Knoxville, Chattanooga, Martin, and Pulaski. Uh, and this localized placement of team members was really done intentionally, really to strategically support the work happening across the state and be closer to where you are and to make sure that we have team members locally where you are. Uh, finally, we're also looking to hire an administrative assistant and an associate director for the Grow Your Own Center to support the great work happening uh, with you and through the grant. Uh, you'll be able to find these opportunities uh, through the University of Tennessee job site, and I believe my colleague Karen will drop uh, that link in the chat, and we hope that you'll continue to help us get the word out uh, and find qualified candidates to help support all this going on. And thank you to the ones already who've helped us identify qualified candidates for the many uh, positions in that pipeline. So I'll, I'll close uh, by just sharing that the University of Tennessee is, is really thrilled, as I said, and honored to be a part of this partnership. We're looking forward to working with you to eliminate financial barriers, uh, to support more accessible pathways for teachers and future teachers, strengthen that teacher and teacher leader pipeline, uh, and increase the number of excellent teachers serving students across the state of Tennessee. So uh, thank you. Happy to answer any questions now, later, or at any time. Uh, and looking forward to bringing the center uh, to you and to those across the state. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Aaron. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bernie and Karen, for dropping that resource in the chat for us. Um, I, and again, takeaways, I'm just thinking the Grow Your Own Center is a one-stop shop. So uh, definitely as we expand models, we, we know that the center will be there to provide technical assistance and guide throughout the way. So thank you so much. Um, at this time, we're going to turn it over back over to Ms. Emma McCauley. She's going to talk to us about the role of the EPP. So this would be the partnership between districts and the EPP. What is that for the EPP and all things involved? So Emma, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Erin. And this this fall as well.
in the Grow Your Own Center. Um, let me just name before we jump into the role of EPPs, when folks think about their typical engagement from a district perspective with the Department of Education, we've got two teams here and you are interacting with a bit of both, right? We've got our Grow Your Own team where you hear myself and Aaron is a part of, and we still maintain our full Office of Educator Licensure and Preparation. Uh, those both exist within our Office of Statewide Supports. The reason that I talk about those as a both and, not an either or, or is that as has been mentioned by Charlene and others, the experience of an apprentice in a registered teacher occupation apprenticeship is still to maintain that teacher's license, that certification or that degree, and that would not be possible without our partners through um, EPPs, our colleges and universities across the state. Um, there's a lot of words on this slide, and in short, what I want folks to hear uh, from a district perspective is that the EPP is your partner, and that much as you have already maintained in many cases primary partnerships with EPPs for a teacher pipeline, uh, that is no different now. The other piece that I really want to emphasize just as folks are thinking about either some of the universities mentioned or partners that you already have, uh, what is important is that any EPP across our state is, is able to apply to be able to offer apprenticeship programs. That's that application that we'll get into here in a bit. Again, so if you are thinking to yourself, I do not have a current partnership with a University of Tennessee school, or I am wondering what my current EPP primary partnership is thinking about about this or thinking about in the space, this is a good time to jot a note down uh, to maybe have some outreach and conversation with your with your school partners to see if they are up to date on some of the exciting opportunities here. Again, hear me say any EPP, regardless if they have done grow your own work up until now or not, are welcome to apply to be able to offer apprenticeships to support districts in this work. The last piece I would say there, just kind of jumping into the next slide so we can keep uh, keep moving through time is that districts would have, excuse me, EPPs have an opportunity to apply from a future subgrant from the Grow Your Own Center to be able to support some of the costs uh, that we know can be typical of this work. There will be more information on that coming soon. We will distribute that uh, primarily to EPPs. We will let our districts know. But again, want folks on the call to be able to hear me say it is a both and, not an either or. Um, we are excited to welcome many, many, many EPP partners into this space to be able to offer more opportunities for our districts across the state. Let's go ahead and jump in just a little bit um, to, to some of the program variety. Again, you'll have a chance to hear from Tracy, and I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out um, to Lavetta, who is on as well from Clarksville, Montgomery. And, and they'll talk about what Clarksville developed in partnership with a three-year bachelor's degree program. You can see that in that first column or that first row, excuse me, it really was facing towards high school students and paraprofessionals in their district. Again, they'll have a chance to kind of tease that out a bit more for us. In that training work, they used both a community college and EPP pathway. They'll talk through some of the costs and, and kind of strategy there, um, a three-year mentor experience and an investment of time of three years to train those candidates. You also heard Charlene mention that we have some flexibility within the hours of, of the length of time an apprentice would train. Um, through new models out of Lipscomb University, as well as the Grow Your Own Center campuses, uh, we have two additional programs that are single year programs. The first is a master's and the second is just a certification. Again, that apprentice would maintain a mentor for that single year of the program, um, and it's in a single year of that investment of your time. Again, Tracy and Lavetta and, and maybe others might want to chime in on some of that newer and newly developed work um, in their partnership with Lipscomb University. The last that I would add on in a degree of hybrid isn't really the right term here, but it's our, our hybrid model. Um, and this was generated first and foremost out of the University of Tennessee Knoxville and will be a part of our UT campuses, as well as any other EPP who would like to offer such a model. Very candidly, this was in response to district feedback that we heard um, about the challenge and urgency to be able to staff positions with that job embedded um, job embedded position. We know many instances that is that is the need and that is the move for districts. When and where available, we want to offer a post back opportunity so that districts could give an apprentice, give a teacher, excuse me, a single year as an apprentice candidate 
transition in that second year into a typical job embedded role, become the teacher of record. The difference here and the true nature of the apprentice is that they would maintain a mentor into that second year. Again, trying to offer options, tools, multiple programs, knowing that the, the more options we can provide, the better. Happy to jump into specifics in this piece in a bit. Again, just wanted folks to hear, we would not be able to do this work without the original model, the bachelor's pathway launched through Clarksville and Austin P. And we now have multiple modes depending on the types of candidates your district has and the types of programs you're interested in offering. So if we go ahead and jump to the next slide, I am gonna pass it back to Erin for her to talk a little bit more specifically about this application that we've spoken of today. Thanks, Erin. Sure thing. Thank you, Emma. So you have gotten a deep dive into all things uh, that are encompassed within the apprenticeship model. And we just want to spend a bit of time speaking to, uh, to you all specifically about what next steps are necessary so that you can uh, offer the apprenticeship model for interested candidates in your district. So I've just dropped a link in the chat to the uh, application itself. Um, and this is an application that is really uh, heavy on the role of EPPs. So EPPs have gotten um, information to support their understanding and their overview of uh, application components. And there is one of the, the eight sections that is specific to districts. So within that, if you are following along in the application, this is going to be section seven, starting on page eight. And we're just going to walk, I'm just going to walk through briefly uh, the application components for you all, what's necessary and where you can find some resources to help complete the application as, as you uh, dive in. So that first component starts on page eight and a screenshot of it is posted here um, on the screen. And that's truly just identifying contact information. So who in the district is going to be the, the program lead and is going to be the primary point of contact for all questions that come about for uh, the apprenticeship, for Grow Your Own, who would be that go-to person? And that would be what you list there for contact information. Right below that at the bottom, there is a, a space for a narrative to really dive into the needs assessment. So this is a place for you to really explore data, looking at uh, HR trends, uh, areas that are hard to feel, vacancy data, and all of the above to really paint the picture and to tell the story of how this model will support some of the, the vacancies that you have in your district to really tap into high needs content areas and areas that have been hard to feel thus far in the past. On the next slide, there is a um, just moving through and dropping one more down. Thank you, Justin. And to really examine that pay scale and salary schedule that Charlene referenced within the apprenticeship model. So you'll see here on this page, there is a screenshot of a reference for a playbook. And this playbook is something that can be a, a great support to uh, use as a, as a reference to really understand different components of the application. And um, Within the playbook, there is guidance to help understand the pay scale, as the pay scale for an apprentice is going to be different than that of support staff that you already have in your district. One important element for the pay scale of an apprentice is that it is progressive, which means that it increases incrementally over time. So an example of how that can be reflected and what you would want to turn in as an attachment with the application is going to be found in the playbook and that reference to that page number would be page 41. Um, but do uh, just a, a, you know, a star by that, that with the salary, the salary must be progressive and increased incrementally over time um, and guidance to really specify um, suggestions to support what that is and how the apprentice would be paid within their time in the pathway is provided in the playbook. Moving on down through the next component of the application is one that we know is a pivotal area of success for the apprentice and that's going to be that of the mentor. So the districts will be charged with identifying who will be mentors for the apprentice that will walk side by side and step by step with the apprentice um, as they're gaining experience and getting those on the job required on the job learning hours. So in this portion of the application, you want to specify in the narrative uh, how a mentor will be selected. Um, if that's going to be an interview, if that's going to be uh, looking at levels of effectiveness, all of the, the competencies that would make a teacher or teacher leader well suited to support a mentor is what you want to specify in the application. Um, there's also um, 
areas and questions to ask, what type of support and training a mentor will have before they begin work with an apprentice, as well as how they will be supported throughout their time. So that it's not just a one-time training and then they're there with the apprentice, but we wanna make sure that the mentors receive quite a bit of support, quite a bit of training and ongoing professional development. So they're well prepared to navigate all of the dynamics that will come with the apprenticeship and with being the support day to day for all their needs as they are, are meeting competencies, as they're gaining experience in the field and as they're learning more about their interaction and work with students. Continuing to move through uh, those competencies, we've heard that uh, a few times throughout. The competencies are what the mentor is going to use to really guide and to check uh, to make sure that the apprentice is demonstrating professionalism, that they uh, are well aware of classroom environments and planning and instructional needs. And this is a requirement of the apprentice as they must have uh, and must be proficient in every area that's outlined uh, before the apprenticeship can be complete to really prove that they have the not only the knowledge and the pedagogy, but they can apply that real time and have demonstrated that boots on the ground in the field with their mentor's support. So with these competencies, there are some, some ideas and some examples to help get you started in what, what are these competencies, how to navigate them, and those can be found in the playbook uh, referenced here, pages 67 through 71. Um, and we also have been encouraging districts to really think about their evaluation model and pulling out some of those elements that would be necessary to have the top ranking and top score um, and using that to help craft and what would be and what would make a competent apprentice throughout their time. Uh, in the apprenticeship. And last but not least, and this is one of the, the legalities that is necessary for the apprenticeship model, and that is of the MOU. So just ensuring that there is the formalized, legally bounding document between the district, between the EPP, that identifies what the roles will be, uh, what the partnership will entail, and also reference to any other third party stakeholders that might also be a support in the work. There is a, a note in the playbook that does recommend also identifying data sharing permissions as both parties have a vested interest in, in being able to dig in the data to, um, to evaluate the effectiveness of the mentor, the, the apprentice, and, and just all the things to make sure that things like that are included in the MOU as that partnership begins. So at, at this time, I have the pleasure of allowing you to hear directly from uh, Clarksville Montgomery Schools by way of Tracy Kuhn, who is going to talk to us about how this apprenticeship model um, is just on a day to day basis. Some of the lessons they've learned and their insight as we learn more about about this model. Well, thank you for having us. Um, we're just excited to be here and uh, excited about this work. And if you'll go on to the next slide, we'll kind of get started on what we do. So my role is an educator pipeline facilitator is I am in direct contact with each resident with each apprentice as they go through their coursework and as they're working in a school as an educational assistant. Just like this slide says we, we started working with um, our paraprofessionals and our teaching as profession students, but that has grown exponentially. We are now in the community. We have many people apply and show interest from um, all walks of life. We have former nurses, we have hospice, we have uh, veterans, we have all different kinds of people really reaching out to be um, to apply for our apprenticeships and for our teacher residency. Right now, we haven't even opened our application yet, but we have 62 people throughout this year that has already that have already reached out to us. And what we do is we put them on a spreadsheet. So as soon as our application opens and we're having um, interest meetings, we send all of them communication and say, hey, it's time, you've talked to us, let's go. So it's very exciting. This is the first year we've had that many. We've had 20, 25, but this year we have 62, I checked right before I got on here, 62 people and it is almost daily that they are reaching out. So our academic structure is they do attend school in the evening, we do pay for them to be an educational assistant. Just like people have said um, earlier, they are working under a highly qualified teacher. We get the joy of going to their schools and watching them in action. And for former teachers like, like I am and like LaVita is, um, that really fills our bucket. 
they are growing. We hear from principals who say that um, the teacher residents, as opposed to people who go through a traditional route for teaching, um, they're both phenomenal, but they are so ready once they come out of that that three-year residency or even the one-year residency for the advanced degrees. So it's very important um, to, to realize that this is working. Um, the employment, they are paid to work as a school system. Uh, they are under a master teacher and it says two years, but that varies. Some of our, our bachelor's degree pathways um, take three years. So they do a four-year degree in three years. It is year-round school. And we'll talk about some of those supports that we that we provide for them because it is such a rigorous program. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Our advanced degrees through Lipscomb, they do a one year residency with that mentor teacher, but then they go on to be the teacher of record. And I think someone alluded to that a little bit earlier. On that mentor teacher, they are paid a stipend and it varies um, anywhere from $1,000 for the year to up to $6,000 for the year, just um, according to what pathway they are working with residents on. So that is a big part of that push to have mentor teachers and for them to work so closely with our competencies and with our residents. Um, a beautiful thing is they can come out with a degree, either a master's degree, a certification, or a bachelor's degree with no debt if they choose. So we do um, provide tuition payment. We provide textbooks. We often even, um, for example, our math majors, we have, <laughs> I'm looking at TI-84 calculators in my office that we uh, kind of just give out to them for the extent of their classes in math that they don't have to pay for them. And I don't know if you've ever bought a TI-84 calculator, but they're well over $100. So just being able to offer that to them for, for the time that they need it is sometimes a make or break for the residents because some of them, that would be a time when they would go, I can't do this. I don't have the means to do this. So it's very important for us to take away as much debt barrier and give them any funding opportunities possible. The apprenticeship is helping in that. Um, just a, a quick story. We had a, a resident whose car had broken down and she couldn't get to work and her children couldn't get to school. Um, we hooked her up with our Workforce Essentials, uh, Marla Rye, who is part of our area. I think it's Northern Middle. And um, she was able to get some help to get her car fixed so that she could get to work and that she could continue on and get to class and do those things. And that's just one story. As far as what LaVita and I do, if a resident reaches out to us or if we hear a need from someone else, we just connect them to our local workforce and we kind of step out because it is a private issue and we just want them to get any kind of funding that, that they can possibly qualify for. But uh, we kind of step out of that. So we don't know all the stories. I'm sure if we knew them all, we could all be crying on, on this because I'm sure it's a beautiful thing. But at that point, we kind of step back and let workforce take over and let them have their dignity and their, their privacy. So the next slide, please. So our um, Grow Your Own Apprenticeship program, we did have a shortage of, of about 80 teachers. I probably think it was higher than that. <laughs> but at that point, we did begin um, something of a Grow Your Own. That year, we started with 40. We started with 40 um, educational assistants or straight out of high school. And I have the pleasure and the, the joy to say that 28 of them graduated on August 5th of this year. Yes, I snot cried through the whole graduation. <laughs> Levita and I just had tissues and everything going because we knew their stories, because we knew their struggles. And some of them, there was no other possible way they would have ever become a teacher or even graduated or even gone to college if they had not had a program like this. Within that, and I just have to tell you some of the supports in, in saying that we know some of their struggles, some of the things that we provide for them is tutoring recitation sessions is what we call them. And we do those for every content class they have. 
So if they're in a calculus class, we find a district teacher that's an expert in calculus. Thank goodness that's not me. <laughs> an expert in calculus. And they get on a one hour Zoom once a week and they support them. How the one way that they can support them is that we have FERPA agreements with every one of our residents. So that means Austin P, National State, Lipscomb University, they give us access to their platform, their grading, their content, um, everything that goes along with what the residents see for their for their coursework. And we're able to tap into that and uh, look, help to get that that content expert from our district, we help them get materials so that they can actually help them with exactly what they're working on. The beauty of also getting a CMCSS person to be that content teacher is they can do that bridge to practice. They are in the classroom every day. So they can say, you know, you think you don't need to know this, but let me tell you what we do with our seventh graders. And this is why you need to know this. And this is the foundation for what they will do later. So they really give that purpose and the why and the foundation behind the coursework that they're having to do. We do offer professional development for our mentors. You know, we know as teachers, uh, these teachers are highly qualified teachers. They're effective, but working with adults is very different. So we try to help them make sure that they are navigating that process in working with their adult resident um, in a really effective, highly effective way that's going to be best for their relationship, for the students in the classroom, because our whole goal is to have highly qualified teachers for our students. That's our main goal. Um, one of the things we did, a lot of people have talked about competencies today, and um, I, I was pleased to be able to help uh, write some of those competencies, and we did base them just strictly on the team observation rubric, and then we added in some professionalism things that we knew they would need as first-year teachers and residents, but we have created a feedback where the mentor teacher is giving the resident feedback every nine weeks. So they're studying the competencies, they're sitting down with them, they're doing one-on-one -on -one conferences and going through and making sure not only are they meeting those competencies, but they're excelling. And they're seeing how these competencies are really linked to that team rubric that during that first observation, they're going to know exactly what is expected. Um, we really, end, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to go fast. I know we're a little behind. <laughs> we really individualize what each resident needs. So for example, um, let's say someone has a, a major life experience. Um, they have to have surgery and they've gotten behind in coursework. We may talk with that principal, pull them out of their school day, still pay them for the day, and allow them to come to where LaVita and I are at central office or in a, in a place where we can work with them. And we will, they will stay with us all day long working on coursework to catch up. So we like to say that there is no resource that we will not try to provide to help them be successful. Um, those we get to oftentimes, so right now we have teachers that have graduated, but they maybe have not finished their praxis and they're still working on trying to take those tests. Maybe they've taken them once or twice before. And just to say this, Austin P has a grant where they pay for their first attempt at praxis. So that's a, another financial burden that is taken away from them. But oftentimes, as you know, life happens and we don't pass every one of those because I think there's six that they have to take. And sometimes one or two or will fall behind. So um, what we do is we have a software program that we have purchased as a district and we help them go through that and help them um, go through those modules and make sure that they are prepared for the second attempt. So it's not a waste, or I don't wanna say a waste of their money, but it's not something because they are financially sometimes very burdened by the cost of those praxis tests. Um, we just spoke with 
several residents this week uh, that are in the classroom teaching, but they're on a permit. So we wanted to do a one-on-one -on -one, face to face. How can we support you? What do you need to get that praxis done? Um, what is your next step? And just helping to professionally coach them through and help to build a timeline because as you know, we can't, we can't leave them in the classroom forever if they don't get that licensure piece. So we are um, working with them. So some of those supports continue even after graduation, <laughs> even after they have uh, become the teacher of record, we are still reaching out to them. We are still working with them. Um, we consider them a resident or at least ours <laughs> if we can claim them as our people until they have that licensure piece. And then I hope that we um, can always stay in touch with them by going into their classrooms. When we visited schools this last couple of weeks, we went into people that have already graduated and are in the classroom teaching and our teacher residents. So it was beautiful to walk in and many of them were just beaming and they were teaching second graders and first graders and kindergartners and they were just beaming with how much confidence they have going into the classroom and just how excited they were to be there. And I think, I think that's probably most of what I have for you guys. Thank you so much, Tracy and Levita, for joining us uh, this afternoon, just hearing the stories and how you have anticipated needs of candidates and offered support. That is really a make or break moment because we know, as you say, it could be a, a, as simple as um, buying a calculator. It could just be the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. So love hearing uh, from you all and thank you all for sharing your work in Clarksville Montgomery to support the apprentice along the, the apprenticeship. As we prepare to wrap up the presentation portion and before we transition and pivot into an open floor of Q&A, we do want to just uh, leave you with some online resources that are available to help unpack some of the things that we might have shared, um, some one pagers, some fact sheets, and also just some, some standing resources about Grow Your Own, and that is going to be available here in the grow your own website. So this is a website that has uh, quite a bit of information here. There's a compare tool that helps identify uh, current partnerships with EPPs and districts, point of contacts, information to elaborate a bit on what Bernie shared about the Grow Your Own Center. Um, and again, just some of those one pagers and fact sheets in the, re in the resources uh, section. Um, and within that, we have um, uh, lots of lots of uh, website tools and things that can help you out as you are thinking about uh, information that might still be needed and where to go and where to use that as a uh, point of reference. Here is a is that um, grow your own website that can be a great support for you throughout your grow your own journey. So I know we have shared a lot. This was a jam packed hour with information from multiple stakeholders that all work collaboratively together to uh, bring the apprenticeship to fruition for candidates. And at this point, we are going to pause our formal presentation. Oh, thank you so much, Emma. Yes, with the web page and the grow your own tool. We're going to pause now and um, just check in with you to see if you have any questions that could be addressed by anyone on the team so we can help navigate your uh, your next steps in where you are and your understanding of Grow Your Own and any additional information that we can offer and provide you real time so that you leave with a bit of information to take back to your district and think about where you all plug into, into the pathway and the opportunity. And as those questions come to mind, you're welcome uh, to unmute yourself and just ask them uh, as they as they come to mind. We're perfectly OK. All former educators, we're OK with wait time. So happy to help as you think through some questions or um, something that we might be able to do to help you out. This is Debbie Presnell. I will start. Um, a quick question as far as a district starting the partnership. 
um, to me, it was a little bit confusing that it looks like the EPP needs to start and then recruit, but we could also, as a district, uh, contact different universities. Is that kind of what you all are suggesting or how to start that process? Thank you. That's a great question, Debbie. Thanks for lifting that up for the group. I'll take two steps back and acknowledge that we have some EPPs who have already been approved to offer registered teacher occupation apprenticeships. Austin P, Lipscomb, and the four UT campuses, Martin, Southern, Knoxville, and Chattanooga, put me on the spot. And we have several EPPs who are in the process of applying to be able to offer teacher occupation apprenticeships, some on this call. What I would name is again, those mentioned EPPs are able to offer models right now. Those programs have already been approved, um, open for connection. The other piece that I would say, and again, this comes from the process standpoint, if your EPP that you've worked with for years is not in that list, our hope is that this conversation gives you a bit more of the resource to engage them in a conversation. If they're thinking about this work, if they want to talk to us about this work, et cetera. You are right that our hope is that EPPs lead that application, recognizing limited district capacity and recognizing the lift of an EPP for some of those documentation purposes, coursework schedules, um, some of the hours. Each EPP, whether they had one partner in apprenticeships or 15 partners in apprenticeships, would call out that individual district application section. So again, your neck of the woods might feel a little bit different than your neighbor down the road and want to be sure that that is the portion of the application districts are really leaning into to reflect their needs uh, and their reality. So one more time, just for folks kind of wondering order of operations, if your EPP that you have partnered with is mentioned in that list of those already approved for apprenticeships. It might just be worth going ahead and connecting to make sure you've got that application sorted. They would already have applied, so they would just need your district piece. If your EPP hasn't been mentioned in that list, uh, that doesn't mean that your institution isn't thinking about it. They just might be in our queue for review. And ultimately, a district can reach out to us if you're trying to figure out which partnerships, which models, uh, which programs are available. But again, the majority of the application, the big lift is living with EPPs, and we thank them for their partnership in that work to design models that really support the needs of districts. Great question, Debbie. Could you go back over, this is Debbie again, go back over that list of approved again. Sure, sure. And let me drop it in the chat as well. Those would be our four UT campuses through the Grow Your Own Center. So that's University of Tennessee, Martin, Southern, Chattanooga, and Knoxville. Additionally, Austin P would be on that list. I should have started there. That would have been first. And then as well, Lipscomb University. And we have a number of programs, uh, excuse me, a number of EPPs who are in process in application right now. Um, not in a place to share those yet, but we'll be happy to update folks as those come online and, and are approved to offer those apprenticeships. One question that I'll lift up, I know there's been a lot of activity in the chat, just for folks who might have missed it as we've been going through conversation, was a question about the cost of praxis and EPP. This was a great question um, from Dr. McCook. Um, Want to share that for any district who is partnering with a Grow Your Own Center program, again, one of those UT campuses, the cost of tuition, the cost of praxis, and the cost of ed TPA would be covered, again, by the Grow Your Own Center. That was a $20 million investment from the or from the Tennessee Department of Education to the University of Tennessee system. And I want folks again to hear us say that there are opportunities for EPPs who are not a part of the UT system to apply for that subgrant to the Grow Your Own Center to still be able to draw down funds to cover the cost of tuition and to cover the cost of praxis and EdTPA. That process is not launched yet. We are looking, I would say fall, we're in fall now. So I would say late fall, early winter is really Again, if you've got questions about the subgrant process, you can direct those either to myself or to Bernie, and we will be sure to keep everyone on this call and not on this call posted on the launch of that.
Okay, this is Sandra in Franklin County. Um, in the playbook, there's a long list of um, federal apprenticeship requirements that have to do with posting uh, positions and where those have to be posted and lots of things like that. Can can somebody speak to that so that that we meet those requirements for the Department of Labor and Workforce? Sure, I'll just tee that up probably pretty generally. And then Tracy, if you have pieces you want to add in from district experience or Charlene pieces from your end that you'd like to comment, um, anything that we would have listened listed, Sandra, that's a great point. We've tried to build that playbook in many ways like checklists. We know that a lot of our educators on the line, we like to operate very organized and with very much a, a first, second and third step. So any of those pieces called out and I don't have a, a page number in front of me wondering if Aaron or Justin might be able to beat me to it for folks looking to reference. Um, I think if there's particular questions about posting timelines, about application processes, e Tracy, don't let me get ahead of you on this piece, but I know in Clarksville, Montgomery, you all have been very intentional to offer interviews for anyone up until now who's been interested to apply for a teacher occupation apprenticeship. I want to let you be able to speak to that. Maybe Charlene, anything else that comes to mind? And Sandra, if there's something on that list in particular that you're stuck on, we can certainly circle back to it. Okay, there's not, and that, that's page 31. If, uh, in Thank the you, book. beat me to it. I appreciate that. <laughs> So as far as posting, we do not post teacher resident um, in in like our, our general um, web, web page website. Um, that is something that we do a specific application for. It does look very similar to an educational assistant application, but it does have some different components because we are wanting them to go to work in, in also go to school to be a teacher. Um, we have worked really closely with our human resources department to create that. So it does go into the system as a teacher. It's just called a teacher resident EA, educational assistant. Um, once they are approved, they're already in the system to be an educational assistant. So it really helps HR not have to do the process twice. So that, that was a good thing that we started. Um, if a teacher resident, um, I'm sorry, just, whew, I, I was thinking about three different things right there. If a teacher resident leaves a position, let's say they say I'm, something's happened, I'm unable to continue with the residency, that position is listed and posted as an educational assistant job, but it's only for the amount of time that that resident would have been in it. So if it's a one-year resident, it's only good for that one year. If it's a three-year resident, then it's good for the three years. Um, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Um, it helps, yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, so we do, and, and Emma did allude to, we do interview everyone. So once we get all that in our uh, system, as far as the human resources system, we do call in each one of them to interview. Last year, we interviewed about 180 people. We do feel very strong. And it's just the three, there's three of us on the team. And the three of us did every one of those interviews. And we just feel that it's very important to hear their story because many times, for example, if you put my GPA in 2018 was a 2.0, we want to hear why. And many times our universities, our EPPs will work with us on students that have um, those lower GPAs because maybe, I mean, we found out someone's mother passed away and that's why they, they bombed a semester and they didn't withdraw or it was too late and they didn't, whatever the situation was. But um, our EPPs will work with us on that if we have a good enough rationale behind it. And if they've proven that, you know, hey, I've overcome that, here I am, I'm ready to do this. So, so do then do you post? So, one of these is positions are posted on both the school district's website and the uh, TDOE education job board. Um, there are things about the length of time that they're posted. Are do you do all of the, uh, all of those things? I mean, are do we have to check the box on everything on this list in order to stay eligible, I guess, is my question. 
we we will interview. We'll take um, you know we'll take applications and interview everyone who is interested. We have some already employed uh, who are very interested that we would you know we'd like to keep, but we're not going to exclude people who are not already here. But um, there are just some some things on the list that I just want to make sure we don't leave out if. You know, if it's going to get us into trouble with the Department of Labor. Great question, Sandra, and thank you for that. Charlene, feel free to jump in. Just want to go ahead and say, and I am looking at that and realizing that the wording of it does make it sound like that job board is a is a must. It is a support for you, Sandra, and other districts on the line. TDOE built that in early COVID and has maintained it. I think it's been a great resource for districts to have a another platform to get the word out. Um, that is not a requirement for apprenticeships okay. and a good note for us on this end to make an edit to the playbook on page 31. Okay. Thanks for that piece. That Thank Charlene, you. yes, ma'am. Charlene, anything else on, on the requirements that your team thinks about when it comes to posting process interviews, et cetera? Sure. So as I look at, at that page in the playbook, that is coming from uh, language that comes from the registered uh, apprenticeship standards. So that language comes from the Department of Labor and in a registered apprenticeship program, there is a required um, equal opportunity plan and affirmative action plan for the sponsor. And so that language is covering that. What that means is when our department comes in and does a program review of the Department of Education and the teacher apprenticeship program, we're just looking for a good faith effort that all opportunities have been distributed and that all applicants went through the same interview process and that that everyone who applied for, you, you really hit the nail on the head, everyone who applied and went through the interview process got the same um, same treatment, same opportunity. That's really what that language is is around in from the apprenticeship standpoint. Perfect. That that clarifies that. Thank you so much. to hear what other questions you might have thinking about where to start and what next steps may entail. All right, well, it sounds that that your questions have been answered and that um, we can wrap up our time today. Again, we just want to say a big thank you to you all. We know on a Thursday afternoon, there are lots of things that could have pulled your attention away, but we very much appreciate your time and your willingness to join us today. As referenced earlier, this webinar, as well as the slides, will be posted on our website. Um, probably uh, by next week so that so that you can use that as a reference as needed. Um, but please feel free to contact us along your journey as we are willing and excited to support your journey into launching a, a Grow Your Own Apprenticeship in your district. So again, we thank you so much uh, for joining us today and we'll be in touch in the future.